three Jews were <clears throat> lined up in front of the uh, execution squad, the firing squad. It's a dark joke. It's a, yeah, some jo Jewish jokes are like that. And um, so the the captain of the the firing squad comes over and as is customary, he offers blindfolds to those who are about to be executed. He goes to the first Jew and he says, would you like a blindfold? He takes the blindfold. And he goes to the second Jew and he says, <clears throat> would you like a blindfold? He takes the blindfold. He goes to the third Jew and he says, would you like a blindfold? And he says, I don't want anything from you. You can keep your lousy blindfold. And his friend says, Mush, don't start up with them. You'll make them angry. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. It's known as one of the most classic Jewish jokes. Don't start up with them, you'll make them angry. You get the joke, you don't get the joke. They're about to be shot. They're gonna be shot either way, okay? Mush, don't start up with them, you're gonna make them angry. Oh, you don't get it. All right, maybe by the end of tonight's class you'll get it. Um, because we're gonna talk, of, yeah, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about apologizing for our own existence. We're gonna talk about walking on eggshells and trying not to upset people um, when it's completely toxic obsession with, with, with approval and uh, getting uh, really dangerous and, and unsafe people to, to approve of us, which is never going to happen, and therefore keep your lousy blindfold. And yeah. So we basically have a story this week, Parshas Vayetze, which is about Yankov Avino, our forefather, our patriarch Jacob. Um, <clears throat> last week he did something very daring, but it wasn't him. It was his mother. She put him up to it. Rivka, Rebecca, <clears throat> told him, dress up like your brother, Esav, Esau, and uh, get, the, get the blessings. And he was scared to do it, but she said, don't worry. It's on me. I'll uh, absorb any of the fallout. And so he did it. But really... You know, you can't really attribute that to his bravery or his courage because it was, and it wasn't even his plan. She came up with the plan and she, she took the uh, responsibility for the plan. So this week, that was last week, but this week, Precious Vayetze is really Yanki Vivino coming into his own, in his own adulthood, his own manhood, and um, becoming uh, not just a son of his parents, but becoming a father to his children. That's where all his... His children are born, and he establishes a house, and he gets married. <clears throat> and also part of his journey into adulthood is to figure out how to deal with really sick people. And specifically, the sick person he was dealing with was his own father-in-law, Lovin, or in English, Laban. I just can't bring myself to say those um, English, old English uh, names. So we're not going to say Jacob and Laban. We're going to say Yankiv and Lovin, and you'll... I have to remember that's what it is. But uh, so he had a father-in-law, Lovin, and uh, he was a sick guy. Lovin was a sick guy. He was uh, he was like the local uh, baron or squire. He basically ran the town of Choron, and uh, he was very abusive and unscrupulous and. He, he had Yankiv work for him as a shepherd. That was the business. That was the family business with sheep. And he kept changing his wages. And he, well, I mean, the biggest thing he did to him, he totally uh, duped him on the whole deal about marrying the preferred bride. Yankiv wanted to marry Rachel. He loved Rachel. And uh, Lovin duped him. And he said, you work for me for seven years. I'll give you Rachel. He worked the seven years and pulled the switcheroo on him. He gave him Leah. And then he said, oh, you want Rachel? Work another seven years. And then... Uh, <clears throat> even then, it was a very unhealthy relationship, even after the 14 years. So uh, he kept switching the deals, kept on you know, coming up with new contracts. And uh, at any rate, at the very end of Parshas Vayetze, so uh, Yankovino runs away. He's, he's had enough of it. He leaves. He leaves. He takes, his, he takes his wives. He takes his children. He says, I'm done with this. I, I don't belong here anymore. And he leaves. And Lovin, predictably, uh, comes running after him. And uh, he catches up with him. And Lovin plays the victim, predictably. Plays the victim. Well, why did you do this? What's so wrong? Why did you want to leave? Why would you, why would you 
deceive me like this? Like, why would you deceive me, right? So <laughs> the accusation is always the confession of the narcissist. But uh, he says, why would you leave? Why would you deceive me? And you run away in the middle of the night. Like, why would you feel unsafe? Like you had to run away in the middle of the night like a refugee, right? And that's, that's the answer. Because, <laughs> you know, because you're a sick person. I had to run away in the middle of the night. And uh, basically what he says, I'll just read to you um, just the, the absolute delusional case that Lovin makes. He says... Um, Yeah. The Yan Lovin, the Yemir al Yankiv. Lovin responded, and he said to Yankiv, Habonais Benesai, your daughters are my daughters. Vahabonim Bonai, and your children, your sons, are my sons. Vatsoin Tsoinai, and your sheep are my sheep. Okay, this is after working for uh, below minimum wage. For two decades. And everything you see here, lihu, it's all mine. It's all mine. So he makes this outlandish claim. How can you leave me? How dare you leave me? Everything you have is mine. So what's Lovin saying? I'll tell you a story. The brisker Rav, the, uh, the Grizz, Rav Yitzchok Zev, Sometimes we refer to him as a velvel, brisker. Once met the Chofetz Chaim. And the Chofetz Chaim was explaining to the brisker of what life for the Jews in Poland was like at that time. And he told him a story. He said, I'll tell you something that just happened recently. There was a 90-year-old Jew who needed a passport to travel abroad. And he never had a passport because he never he never left the country. So he went to the local uh, government office and he says, I need a passport. So they said to this 90-year-old Jew, do you have a birth certificate? He says, birth certificate? I mean, I was <laughs> born in, at home. We didn't have birth certificates. We don't have documentation. So they said, oh, that's a big problem. You don't have a birth certificate. You have to have documentation. Um, but what you could do is you could bring us two witnesses who were present when you were born. Now the Chofetz Chaim says to the Biskarov, this Yid is 90 years old. You understand how preposterous this is. If he were to have to find witnesses that, rem that were old enough to remember him being born, they would have to be over 100 years old themselves. It's preposterous. It's not, it's not possible. So how could the government ask for such a ridiculous thing from this 90-year-old Jew? The Chofetz Chaim said to the Biskarov, he says, it's very simple. I'll tell you how the government could ask such a preposterous thing from this 90-year-old Jew. Because their opinion of us is the same opinion that Lovin had of Yankiv. Lovin said to Yankiv, Habonais b'neisai, Habonim bonai, Hatsayin tsayna, V'chol asher atoreya lihu. It's all mine! It's all mine. In other words, you don't even have a right to exist. And now you're coming asking for favors? So they have no inclination to be reasonable with us when they don't even believe we have a right to exist. That's what the, the Chofetz Chaim told the Brisker of. In other words, I mean, he was describing the, the attitude of the Polish government of that era, but he was also describing the attitude of Lovin, and he was describing the attitude of all the Lovins in our lives and, and throughout history, who you ask yourself, why is this person being so unreasonable with me? Like, what do they want from me? And, and the real answer, if you really want to make sense of it is, they don't even believe you have a right to exist. See, from the perspective of Lovin, it's all mine. It's all me. Everything is me. Everything is me. And everyone else, there's only two kinds of other people. There's me, and I exist. And then for everyone else, there's only two kinds of people. People who bow down to my existence and enhance my existence, or people who get in the way of my existence. Those are my enemies, and I have to destroy them. Because for the, <laughs> the fragile ego 
of a lovun, anyone who's not totally surrendered to him is a threat to his existence. So that's how he sees it. Your existence is, a, is an existential threat to my existence. You don't even deserve to exist. And therefore, that's, that's, that's why they can justify all this type of cruel and, and disgusting behavior. Lovin doesn't sit there and think to himself, why am I taking advantage of this guy? He's my relative. First of all, he's my nephew. Now he's married into the family. He's my son-in-law. Like, why would... Or even if you were a stranger, why would you treat a person like he doesn't think that way? Because the underlying assumption is, look, it's all me. Everything is me. Anyone who gets into my life, anyone who appears on my radar, either they can enhance my existence, work for me, agree with me, like me, or they are an absolute existential threat and they have to be destroyed. They have no, they have no right to exist. So how do you deal with a person like that? How do you deal with a person like that? There's no way to deal with a person like that. And that's what Jan Gavino says. He says to love him, ultimately. He, call, he tries to call him out on it. He says to him, Yankov got angry and he started to argue with Lovin. The Yan Yankov, and Yankov answered. The Yemel Lovin, he said to Lovin, Ma Pishi, what is my sin? Ma Chatosi, what's my transgression? Kidalak Dacharai, that you ran after me. In other words, tell me what I did. What did I do? Tell me, charge me with a crime, habeas corpus. What did I do? Of course, the answer is, you know, your crime is, I mean, Lovin won't admit it. Your crime is that you exist. And your very existence is a threat to me. Lovin won't admit that, but that's the truth. Yankov's trying to call him out on Tell me what I did. And we're all, to some extent, susceptible to this type of thinking. I'm talking about Yankov's type of thinking, where we start actually believing this absolutely irrational, unreasonable message that... that we should apologize for our own existence. You ever be walking through a door? So you're walking through a doorway, and someone else comes walking through the doorway. So what do you say? So a lot of us, we say, I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? What did you do? You did something wrong? Don't say I'm sorry. Say pardon me. Say excuse me. Don't say I'm sorry. It's interesting, though. For many of us, that's a reflex. I'm sorry means I did something wrong. Now. Most of us are not perfect, and we do things that are wrong. And so from time to time, we do have to actually say, I'm sorry. But why don't you say, I'm sorry, when you actually did wrong, when you actually are repentant about your behavior, you, you wish you hadn't done what you did, you did something wrong, okay, so say, I'm sorry. But I'm walking through a doorway. I don't have a right to walk through a doorway. Oh, I'm sorry. But there's something in, in, in many of us, <laughs> I would say... If you don't relate to this, maybe you should ask yourself, maybe you're the love one. <laughs> because there's love ones and there's Yankees. But if you're a Yankee, which I think most of us are, most normal people, I think, we, we, we do that a lot. We apologize for our own existence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what? That, that my body takes up space? That I'm walking from point A to point B? That the, the doorway is here? and that, Like, I didn't do anything wrong. So be polite, say, excuse me, pardon me. Don't say, I'm sorry, you didn't, there was no offense. And that's what Yankov is trying to sort of set the record straight on when he says to, to Lovin, ma pishi, ma chatosi, what's my sin? What's my sin? What did I do wrong? Did I hurt you? I didn't do anything. All I did was exist. And my existence bothered you. And the only way my existence wouldn't bother you is if I would be completely nullified to you and, and, and agree to your narrative that everything I have is yours. You want the only way my existence will not be an affront and an assault to the Lovon is if I can agree to his insane narrative that I'm ready to completely roll over and have no self-esteem, no self-confidence, no, no responsibility toward making choices for myself. No, I cannot allow them to make good choices for myself. I have to only do what Lovin wants, and if I don't do what he wants, then I'm, I'm, I'm attacking him. You know, I, I heard somebody say once an expression, everybody's got to be somewhere. Sounds so simple, but it's true. Everyone's got to be somewhere. You can use that to help you be more tolerant of others. I think you can also use that finding some peace 
within yourself. Like, I'm not doing anything wrong by existing. To the contrary, if I really want to get philosophical about it, why do I exist? Or how do I exist? How did I come into being? I didn't produce myself. God made me. So go talk to him. In other words, if God made me, then there's nothing to apologize for, for being made. Guy was talking to me this week, and he said that he's struggling with the, the idea of unconditional self-worth. A uh, young man, and he said that he's struggling with it. He's trying to figure out if he really got that from his parents. He's thinking he didn't, and he's trying to find it now. Um, certain baseline of self-love. So I, I, I said to him, you know, you, you're questioning whether or not you got it from your parents. And those of you who know that I'm very into parenting and I give parenting courses, this is one of my biggest things I tell parents is give this to your child. But at the end of the day, some parents don't. And, you know, this guy's already grown up. So that's, that's it. He didn't get it from his parents. And so I, I said, look, you didn't, you didn't get it from your parents. Now you can choose to try to find it. The biggest mistake, by the way, most common mistake, try to find it from your spouse. <laughs> the biggest mistake, try to find unconditional positive regard, permission to exist from a spouse. That's a, a good formula for uh, disaster, right? And the reason is, I explained to him, because no human being can give you permission to exist. You're trying to get from a human being what they don't have. You're trying to get something from them they don't have to give you. So ultimately, the only source for this unconditional validation for your existence is from your maker. It's in your relationship with God. No human being can give you permission to exist. And the biggest mistake we make is trying to curry favor with people, becoming people pleasers, and even compromising our sense of self-worth and doing things we're uncomfortable doing, and doing things that are against our values and against our even our sense of safety, in order to try to get approval from people, and it's just a, it's a fool's errand because even after you do all that and you compromise all that, they can't give you that which you're seeking from them. A human being cannot give you permission to exist. Only God can give us permission to exist. And, and God doesn't even have to grant us permission to exist. He's already granted it to us by, by making us exist. It's implicit in our existence. We have inherent self-worth just from the fact that we exist. So I told this guy, I said, you're going to go to human beings. And you're going to try to get a human being to love you and validate you in a way that will finally make you feel comfortable in your own skin. And it will never happen. Instead, you're going to burn people out and get into codependent relationships where you're basically compromising yourself in order to try to get something from somebody that they don't have to give you. So instead, you have to get it from God. So he's like, I'm, I'm not so good right now with my relationship with God. I said, look, you know, you're going you're gonna to accuse me of being a rabbi, and I'm going to say something very predictable. You know, rabbis always are trying to push God on people, right? It's like a predictable line. I said, but <laughs> look, trust me, I'm not, I'm not trying to push the God answer because I have any like skin in the game here. I, I, I'm trying to be pragmatic here. You're telling me you're seeking this concept called unconditional self-worth, which is a, who says that even exists? You, you, I don't know where he got it from, but he's saying, I, this is what I want. I want to be able to totally embrace and accept myself. I exist and therefore I'm okay with myself. I said, that's beautiful, but how do you even know that that's, that's true? How do you know it's true that you're, you're, you have inherent self-worth? That just because you exist means you're worthy of existence. I happen to agree with you, but how do you know it's true? So he didn't have a reason to defend how he knew. He just felt it was true. I said, well, I could defend it, and I could argue that it is true. And the, but the way that I would argue it, I'm sorry to tell you, I can't avoid the God concept. Because without invoking the idea that an infinite, absolute existence chose to bring my conditional existence into being, then I don't even have a philosophical leg to stand on arguing for my own inherent self-worth. So, you know that old country, that, that country song from the 70s, looking for love in all the wrong places. You're going to go and you're going to get burnt out trying to get people to give you permission to exist. You're not going to find it. Where do you find it? In fact, 
Where do you already have it in the fact that you are a creation of God? So he, he, here's the problem. The problem is a love one. Let's, let's call him a narcissist. Although I don't use that term clinically. I'm not a mental health professional and I want to be very clear. I'm just using the term colloquially the way that people use it nowadays in internet memes and such. So don't hold me to any of these, you know, the technicality of, of the terms here. But you have a love and a narcissist who feels affronted and threatened just by the fact that you exist, just, just by the fact that you're going to do what's good for you and not put him first, first, put him first, at last, everything in between. So what the problem is, we understand what the problem is. The problem is that we actually buy into it and we start feeling self-conscious and we start <laughs> apologizing for our own existence. Um, so what's the solution? The solution is mapped out here too. Everything's in the Torah. The, the solution is, <clears throat> is mapped out here too. In the conversation between Yaakov and Asaph. It's, 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 it's right here. Um, Lovin says to Yankiv, Viata now, Hole Holachta, going, you have been going. Kinichsef Nichsafta, because yearning, you've been yearning. Lavesa Vicha for the house of your father. Lama Ganafta Esalekoi. Why did you steal my gods? That's his statement. I'm going to ask you three questions. Don't get nervous. I know when rabbis start saying biblical verses and asking questions, and then things can get tedious, but bear with me. Question number one. What does it mean, holoich um, holachto, going you've been going? We're familiar if you if you learn Torah in Hebrew, you you know you're familiar with that that verb formulation. It means something that happens more than once, something that's a repeated action. Like for instance, we had it earlier at the very beginning of the Torah when God told Adam and Eve that they could eat from the the, the tree, the other trees of the garden. He said, "Eating you can eat," which means eat as much as you want, eat as often as you want. Or like later it tells us the mitzvah commandment to give tzedakah, to give charity. So it says, giving you shall give, which means don't just give once, give as often as, as needed. It, the, the verb formulation means a repeated action. So my first question is, halachta means going, you've been going. What are you talking about? How many times did Yaakov go? This is, the, as far as we read, this is the only time he actually left Lovin's house. So why does Lovin say to him, going, you've been going? Okay, first question. Second question, he says to him, <coughs> Nichsaif nichsafta. Yearning, you've been yearning. Lavesavicha for your father's house. That is out of character for Lovin. Since when is Lovin empathetic? Since when is he capable of understanding the Yankiv may be running away because he's yearning to return home? That, that's not something that Lovin would think about. In fact, that, that's, that would sound, you would think that if someone were to make that argument to Lovin, he'd be incapable of even validating it. Who cares what, what Yaakov feels? Only my feelings matter. So why does Yaakov say that? Nichsef nichsafta, you've been yearning to go home. Like why is all of a sudden he's in touch with emotions and other people's emotions? He's being empathetic. Like, trust me, it can't be. <laughs> That's for sure not. They say when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Okay, Lavan already showed us who he is. He didn't all of a sudden become empathetic. Okay, so that's the second question. Third question is what's the end of that Pasuk? The end of the verse, Loma Ganavta Salakai, why did you steal my gods? Now I understand the simple meaning is he had some idols, and that Yankov's wife Rachel, Lovin's daughter, Rachel, Rachel, stole the idols. So he's talking about that. The simple meaning is he's referring to that. But I'm asking more like the the flow of the sentence. Going, you've been going, because yearning you've been yearning for your father's house. Why did you steal my gods? Like, what's the flow? What's the progression? Why does that? Why is that a coherent sentence? Okay, all right. So if we're going to answer these three questions. We're going to understand the solution to dealing with this type of person who makes us question the validity of our own existence. So 
Question number one was, what is this going you've been going? If you look back <coughs> earlier, there was an attempt to leave. I'm looking back the previous chapter, chapter 30, Perik Lamed, verse uh, 25, Pasuk Chof When Rachel gave birth to Joseph. Send me and I'll leave. I'll go back to my place, back to my land. There was an earlier attempt. And Yankov asks, no shai let me have my wife, my wives and my children. Asher which I already served you for. I already you've already been paid in full. You've already been paid in full. Ve'lech, I'm gonna go. And he mentions, you know that I've been serving you very faithfully all these years. I didn't I didn't complain about all the times you changed the deals and the conditions. And what happens? Lovin talks him into a new contract. That attempt, yeah, that attempt to leave, that's when Yosef was born. He stayed six more years. That attempt to leave actually turns into an extension of the contract. He stays. So going you've been going means, Lovin says, you've been at this point before. I know you've been wanting to leave for a long time. I don't even think you wanted to be here the first time seven years when you were serving what, for what you thought was the girl you wanted to marry. You didn't even want to be here the first seven years. But So I know that you've had a foot out the door. This is the insecurity of the narcissist. I know that you're, you've been trying to leave me this whole time. So that's the answer to the first question. Lovin is saying, I'm very much aware that you tried to leave, but I want to remind you something, and this is the answer to the second question. You're yearning. You've been yearning. You're yearning now. You're running away because you're yearning to go home. You yearned before. This is not new. Lovin says, this is not new. This is not new that all of a sudden you have this deep desire to get out of here and go home. You had this before. Yearning, you've been yearning. That's the double verb. Yearning, you've been yearning. And we worked it out before, Lovin says. Last time that you were yearning, you came to me. You talked it out with me. And I settled you down. I talked sense into you and I got you to stay. So that's what Lovin is saying to him. Why didn't you do this time like you've done every other time? When you were at the brink, when I pushed you, when I abused you to the point where you didn't think you could last one minute longer with me, but you did the sensible thing, Yank. If you came to me and you let me settle you down. You understand? This is, this is the consummate abuser. It's not enough I do to you what I do to you. But when you start to see through the gaslighting and you start trying to make good choices for yourself, what does the abuser say? Come to me. Let me be your therapist. I'll help you process it. I'll help you realize who the real victim is. Just when you thought that you couldn't take it anymore, no, come to me and I'll help you to readjust your thinking. So that's what Lovin is saying to Yankiv. If, if you were at that threshold, you should have done what you did in the past. Come to me and we'll work it out again, and we'll extend your contract another time. But this time Yankiv didn't do that. This time Yankiv, as a, as a husband and as a father of children, he did the adult thing. And he said, you know what? I, I can't live for this guy. I can't live for this crazy guy. And he did what was right for himself and for his children. And that's the, the rest of the verse. Why did you steal my gods? What are Lovin's gods? Power and control, like any abuser. Power and control. So Lovin's gods are power and control. When Yaakov finally makes a good decision for himself, Lovin says to him, by not coming to me and allowing me to talk you out of doing the responsible adult thing for you and your family, you stole my gods. You stole my gods. You took away my power and control, or my illusion of power and control. And what does Yaakov answer to that? Nothing. You know why? Because he's finally free. There is no answer to that. When the abuser says, 
Why did you finally break free from my spell and do what's right for you? You're taking away my gods. You cannot answer. You answer one word, you fall right back in the trap. You'll be sucked in. The only answer is no answer. If, if, if by me doing what's right for me and my family, you feel that your gods have been stripped from you, I think you need a new religion. But we don't even say that to him. Because even getting into that conversation is already leverage. So Yaakov goes on his way, and he leaves. And it's, it's so fascinating that even after he leaves, Lovin is still sick. He's still absolutely sick. They made a peace treaty. They basically said, boundaries. <laughs> the only thing you can do with such a person, you got to have boundaries. So they made a peace treaty. They had boundaries. Literally, they had a pile of stones. They had a pile of stones. And uh, Yaakov called it Gal Aid, meaning a pile of stones which testifies to the boundary that I'm keeping. And so interesting. Vayikra Lai Lovin. But Lovin called it, he called the pile of stones, Yegar Sadusa, which is an Aramaic word. The Yaakov Karolai Galeid. Yaakov called it Galeid, which, as we said, means the testimony pile of stones. You know what that means? The Sforno actually says this. Great medieval Italian uh, rabbi, Rabbi Vadya Sforno. He says, the reason that Lovin had his own name for the pile of stones is because even when they separated and they agreed to separate, he had to spin the narrative. He could not allow that Yankov should have the last word to be able to tell his own story. He had to have his version of the story. He had to say, oh, yeah, they call it Galet. We call it Igarsa and Dusa. He still had to have his narrative because... If you can't control Yaakov to stay, at least you can say whatever you want about him. And, I, I, and, I, and, and trust me, Lovin had, I'm sure, plenty to say about Yaakov after he left. Oh yeah, we, we really dealt with that. He wasn't such a good shepherd, but yeah, we, dealed with him, we dealt with him for 20 years. I tried, I really tried, I tried to work with the kid. Eventually, I don't know, it was just pathetic. Uh, we had to let him go, right? Doesn't matter. Lovin's going to say whatever he's going to say. He's got to because in his his fragile existence depends on being able to control that narrative. Okay, so he's going to say whatever he's going to say. The point is, Yankov is finally doing what he needs to do as an adult. So last week in Parshas Toil Days, Rivka came up with a daring plan. And Rivka took responsibility for the fallout. And Yankov was just taking orders. In Parshas Vayetze this week, Yankov becomes an adult, a responsible father, a responsible husband who takes care of the well-being, the welfare of his family. And when other people come and say, I need you to turn your whole life upside down to cater to my fragile ego, it took him 20 years, but eventually Yankov said, this is insanity. I'm leaving. I'm not giving this guy a reply. I don't owe him any reply. And I'm sticking to my narrative. No, we're not going to sign the non-disclosure agreement where I'm not allowed to say the truth. No, this is a galade. This is the story. This is what happened. I'm not trying to make love and agree to it. I know he'll never agree to it. He's going to say what he's going to say, but I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And at this point, Yankiv was actually ready for Mashiach. He was ready for redemption. Because right after this episode, the end of Vayetai becomes Vayishlach. <coughs> Vayishlach, next week's Torah portion, is Yaakov tells his brother Esav, I'm ready for us to have our reunion. Now Yaakov knew that his murderous brother would only make peace with him in the Messianic era. But that is how at peace with himself he felt after he'd finally done the right thing regarding Lovan. Yankov said, now I'm ready for world peace. I'm ready to make peace with Esav, and Mashiach can come. Now the reality is that Esav wasn't ready, and the world wasn't ready. 
and it took a few more thousand years, but it's, it's coming soon. But for his part, as an individual, Yankov had his, his, his complete internal messianic redemption by finally cutting himself off from this abuser and this user. So this is a, a very important formula to all of us who uh, may be dealing with difficult people or you may interact from time to time with difficult people. Don't apologize for your own existence. 